It is time to meet St. Philomena, published on August 11, 2007 by Dr. Mark Miravalli and General Mariology. I would like to introduce you to a young, early virgin martyr who has received extraordinary honor in the church from popes, bishops, saints, and mystics. Pope Gregory XVI referred to her as the wonder worker of the 19th century. Blessed Pope Pius IX declared her the patroness of the children of Mary. St. John Vianney attributed all of his miracles to her, stating, I have never asked for anything through the intercession of my little saint without having been answered. Blessed Anna Maria Taigi, the Roman mother mystic, received through this saint the miraculous cure of her granddaughter and entrusted all her children to her powerful intercession. And the popes of the 19th century showered this young saint with numerous plenary indulgences and in gifts such as papal rings and pectoral crosses. It is time for you to meet Saint Philomena, powerful with God, in the words of Gregory XVI. As she was a thaumaturga of the 19th century, so she continues her wonder-working ways in our 21st century. Devotion to Saint Philomena is spreading like a rekindled wildfire throughout the Universal Church today, with testimonies to her miraculous intercession being received by the International Shrine of Saint Philomena in Mugnano, Italy, from all parts of the world. Saint Philomena wishes to exercise her remarkable power of intercession precisely for you. The Discovery of Saint Philomena on May 24, 1802, workers digging in the ancient catacombs of Priscilla in Rome made an exciting discovery. While excavating near the Greek chapel, one of the earliest sections of the catacombs, they found a previously unrecorded grave, a type of grave hewn out of the rock called loculus. Sensing the importance of what they had unearthed and following the instruction given them by Monsignor Hyacinth Ponzetti, the Vatican custodian of holy relics, Work was immediately halted, and Father Filippo Ludovici, the official Vatican overseer of all excavations, was informed. The next day, May 25, 1802, Father Ludovici entered the catacombs with several other observers and officially documented the new grave. It was found to be sealed by three terracotta brick tiles arranged side by side. Engraved on the tiles were a palm branch, typically used to symbolize martyrdom, arrows, a lily, typically used to symbolize purity or virginity, and an anchor. On the tiles, painted in red from left to right, was an inscription. The first tile read, Lumina, the second tile, Paxti, and the third read, Kumfi. An anatomical examination of the bones found within led to the conclusion that the person entombed was a young girl, approximately 12 to 13 years old. Also found in the grave was a vial of dried blood, which was the early church's typical manner of indicating the grave of a martyr. Monsignor Ponzetti, the Vatican custodian of holy relics, read the tiles according to the ancient custom of starting with the second tile as Pax Ticum Filumena, or Peace Be With You, Filumena, and officially rendered the young martyr's name as Filumena, Philomena in English. Monsignor Ponzetti sought historical records for Filumena, but none were found. Not long after the discovery of the tomb, a humble parish priest, Father Francesco di Lucia, from the small town of Mugnano near Naples, arrived in Rome seeking relics of a martyr to spiritually revitalize his parish, which had grown weak in virtue according to the pastor. Through the special assistance of di Lucia's bishop-elect of Nola, Monsignor Bartolomeo de Caesare, Wherein Mugnano was located, in 1805, Pope Pius VII consigned the sacred remains of Filumena to Father Di Lucia for the people of Mugnano. Father Di Lucia took the relics from Rome back to Mugnano, and the ride home turned out to be rather unusual. At one point, the priest heard a knocking that came from the box containing the sacred remains of Filumena. As the knocking continued, Father Di Lucia realized that the sacred remains were underneath the carriage, which was not a particularly reverent location for sacred relics. He decided that these holy remains should ride next to him in the carriage, and when they were put in this more reverential place, the knocking ceased for the remainder of the journey. When Father Di Lucia stopped over in Naples at the home of the Teres family, there began the miracles of healing for which Saint Philomena was soon to become famous. 
the porter who assisted in carrying the virgin martyr's relics was instantly cured of nephritis, and a lawyer with severe sciatica who was carried into the family chapel was instantly cured. A woman present who had a cancerous ulcer and who was scheduled for amputation the next day was also instantly cured of both cancer and the spreading gangrene when a relic of St. Philomena was placed over her sores. Immediately upon the arrival of the remains of Philomena in Mugnano on August 10, 1805, bishops and parish priests of the region began to officially document an extraordinary number of miracles. Here are just a few examples as recorded in the diocesan and parish archives and later submitted to the Holy See. As soon as the sacred body of Philomena entered Our Lady of Grace Parish Church, the church bells started ringing on their own. The town paralytic, Angelo Bianco, upon merely hearing the bells, was instantly cured and ran into the church, to the amazement of all in attendance. Within the first week of the arrival of Filomena, a mother of a blind son dipped her fingers into the oil of the lamp burning beside the tomb, placed the oil on the eyes of her son, and he was instantly healed. This constituted only the first week of the miraculous intercession of Filomena, all officially documented in the archives of Our Lady of Grace Church in Mugnano and confirmed by the local Bishop of Nola. Over the next few years, the fame of Philomena spread throughout Italy and beyond. There were numerous reports of miracles, and many of these reports reached Pope Gregory XVI. For example, the renowned Roman mystic Blessed Anna Maria Taigi prayed daily to Philomena when her granddaughter Pepina seriously damaged her eye by tearing the pupil irreparably Blessed Anna Maria blessed the child with some oil of Philomena, which had come from the lamp burning next to her tomb. The next morning, Pepina had perfect sight, and the miracle was confirmed by several doctors' examinations. On her deathbed, Blessed Anna Maria entrusted her family and children to Philomena's care. When the Holy See began to consider elevating the devotional status of Philomena to the altar of the church, a miraculous phenomenon took place which was directly experienced and verified by the Vatican Congregation of Rites itself, presently known as the Congregation for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments. Bishop Caesare of the Nola Diocese had begun to send out small quantities of dust from the bones of the relics of Philomena to neighboring parishes and dioceses. It soon became evident to the bishop, however, that even though he continued to send out bone dust, the amount of dust remaining never decreased. It seemed as if a miraculous multiplication of the dust was taking place. When this apparent miracle was brought to the attention of the Congregation of Rites at the Vatican, they decided to conduct an experiment. The congregation began to distribute the bone dust of Philomena to diverse parts of Italy, while at the same time sending out bone dust from the remains of another Roman martyr in the same manner. What the congregation witnessed was a decrease in the amount of bone dust from the other Roman martyr's remains, but a miraculous preservation of the bone dust of Philomena, which did not diminish. The Holy See experienced firsthand the manifest will of God to make this young martyr known publicly through her historically documented miracles. The most famous miracle of Philomena, one directly confirmed by Pope Gregory XVI, was experienced by Venerable Pauline Jaricot, the daughter of a French aristocratic family and a close friend of St. John Vianney. Pauline was a tireless worker for the church. She was the lay founder of the Vatican Congregation Propaganda Fide, or the Society for the Propagation of the Faith. As a young woman, she had gone to the textile workers of Lyon to ask them to contribute a penny a week for the spread of the faith in missionary lands. This work became so successful that it eventually led to the Vatican taking over the guidance of the society and developing it into a curial office of the Holy See under the title of Propaganda Fide. Venerable Pauline was also the founder of the Society of the Living Rosary. In 1834, at the age of 35, Pauline Jaricot became gravely ill. She was dying of serious heart disease, and it was thought she had only weeks left to live. At the encouragement of St. John Vianney, she decided to undertake a pilgrimage to the tomb of St. Philomena, against all medical counsel. Arriving in Rome en route to Mugnano, which was farther south, she stopped to visit with Gregory XVI, but being too ill, she was unable to attend the scheduled audience. 
Out of respect for Pauline, the Holy Father went to see her personally at the Sacred Heart Convent where she was staying. Upon seeing her, Pope Gregory knew that she had not long to live and asked her, Pray for the Church as soon as you arrive in Paradise. Pauline responded, Yes, Holy Father, I promise you, but if I walk on foot to the Vatican upon my return from Mugnano, would Your Holiness deign to proceed without delay to the final inquiry into the cause of Philomena? Gregory XVI replied, Of course, for in that case, it would be a first-class miracle. But he personally had no doubt that Pauline's time on earth was at an end. Turning to the Italian sister who had accompanied him on his visit, he said in Italian, so as not to be overheard by Pauline, we will never see her again. On August 8, 1835, Pauline arrived at Mugnano looking more like a corpse than a living person, according to witnesses. By this time, Pauline was no longer able to speak. That evening, the infirm woman attended a long ceremony at the church, but there was no miracle. On August 9th, she attended several masses and received Holy Communion, and still, there was no miracle. Pauline returned to the church on Sunday night and again on Monday morning, August 10th, still no miracle. By this time, the entire town of Mugnano was well aware of the drama taking place at the shrine of their little martyr. As the days passed and Pauline was not cured, the townspeople became increasingly worried and adopted a good-hearted but perhaps peculiarly southern Italian form of petition to St. Philomena. Pounding on her grave, they reminded her that her reputation was at stake. Do you hear us, Philomena? If you do not cure this pious lady, we will pray to you no more. We will have nothing to do with you. Return her to health right now. Later that day, on Monday the 10th, precisely at the moment of benediction of the Eucharistic Jesus, and 30 years to the day that Philomena arrived in Mugnano, Pauline Jarico was completely and instantaneously cured. The next day, before a huge crowd, Pauline set off walking without assistance towards Rome, and the crowds accompanied her much of the way. On her arrival in Rome, Pauline decided to visit the Holy Father unannounced. Upon entering the audience chamber, she shocked Gregory XVI, who immediately exclaimed, Is it really you or an apparition of you? Is this really my dear daughter? And has she come back from the grave, or has God manifested in her favor the power of the virgin martyr? Stunned, Pope Gregory had Pauline walk through the halls of the Vatican repeatedly and also requested her to stay in Rome for an entire year to verify her miraculous cure. Keeping his word to Pauline, Pope Gregory XVI, on January 13, 1837, in a solemn decree based solely on the power of her undeniable miracles, raised an unknown 13-year-old early martyr named Philomena to the altar of the church, granting a mass in her honor and thereby giving official approval to public devotion to her. This liturgical honor constituted the only instance of a proper office being granted to a saint from the catacombs of whom nothing is known except her name and the bare fact that she was martyred for the faith. Philomena was now officially Saint Philomena, a canonized saint of the Catholic Church. We must particularly underscore here the inspired wisdom of Pope Gregory XVI. The Holy Father rightly recognized the evidence of the large number of ecclesiastically documented miracles as being of greater importance than the secondary details of St. Philomena's personal history. God's manifested testimony to the historical reality of the person of St. Philomena through her supernatural intercession took precedence over the specific historical details of the Virgin Martyr's early life. In effect, the Pope acknowledged the miracles in themselves as historical facts. Authentic miracles constitute God's greatest confirmation of the historical reality of the human person in question and, moreover, manifest heaven's desire for that person to be recognized and venerated by the people of God on earth. The miracles of St. Philomena assured Pope Gregory and assure us of her preeminent sanctity and her ongoing role in the life of the Church. Typically, without documented miracles, the cause of an individual person does not advance past the status of servant of God, even with extensive evidence of an earthly life of heroic virtue. The Church places its greatest criteria for canonization, along with an essential testimony to the person's virtues, upon heaven's witness to the sanctity of the candidate which is made manifest through miracles obtained through the candidate's intercession. 
It was therefore most appropriate for Gregory XVI to place greater importance upon the history of documented miracles through St. Philomena's intercession during the canonization discernment process rather than upon the lack of personal details regarding St. Philomena's earthly existence Beyond establishing the fact of her martyrdom, as the guidelines of the Church indicate should be done, it was, above all, the miracles of St. Philomena that moved the Church to proclaim her a saint. Similarly, contemporary examination of St. Philomena's status should use the same criterion of evaluation. Personal History of St. Philomena and Private Revelation During that remarkable period of the 1830s when miracles abounded through St. Philomena's intercession and the Church granted her public liturgical veneration, three separate individuals in different parts of Italy, completely unknown to each other, began receiving details of the historical background of St. Philomena through various modes of private revelation. The most significant were locutions received by Sister Luisa di Gesù in August of 1833, Revelations, which received approval by the Holy Office, presently the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, on December 21, 1833. One day, while praying to St. Philomena, Sister Louise of Jesus thought she heard words coming from a statue of the saint giving her specific date of death, August 10th, and details of her journey to Mugnano, which were unknown to the general public. Sister Louisa, fearing she was suffering from a delusion, increased her prayers and fasting and, under obedience, observed complete silence during subsequent revelations. Sister Louisa's superior then wrote to Father Di Lucia reporting the supposedly revealed details given about the Romuniano journey and asking about their veracity. Father Di Lucia confirmed every detail of the revelation is perfectly accurate and requested that the nun be open to any more revelations pertaining to the life of Philomena. Under obedience, Sister Luisa prayed for further information and immediately the same voice began revealing the 3rd to 4th century historical life of St. Philomena, which we reproduce from the original text in the beginning of the video. There are several things noteworthy about this extraordinary account. Historically, the evil emperor Diocletian was indeed known for executing Christians by arrows. Diocletian was also known for killing Christians by tying anchors around their necks and having them thrown into the Tiber. Furthermore, Philomena being first named Lumina, which means light, and then being given her second name, Philumena, in baptism, would be consistent with the way her name was depicted on the tiles. Lumina first, and then combined with the last tile, Philomena. Why is St. Philomena making such a powerful spiritual return in our own times? I believe one reason is that the youth of today need an example of heroic Christian purity. Even when they do not find support for purity from their society, their friends, even at times from their own parents, many of today's youth are being exposed to numerous occasions of blasphemy and impurity through pornography, immodest clothing, obscene movies, and oftentimes, most tragically, with the consent of their parents. Today's youth need a young heroic witness for the upholding of Christian purity, even if their peers and their own parents are not encouraging them. They face situations very similar to those which Philomena had to contend with. Both the emperor and her parents encouraged her to become the Empress of Rome, the highest position of power and fame the world could offer any woman. Similarly, our young people are continually tempted by the allure of power and pride and illicit pleasures. Because Philomena said yes to Christ and to his kingdom, it is little wonder that Jesus is making her well known again as the patroness of purity for the young people of the 21st century. The Popes of the 19th and 20th centuries The Holy Fathers of the 19th and early 20th century manifested remarkable devotion to the young princess virgin martyr, for example, Pope Leo XII granted permission for altars to be dedicated and chapels to be erected in her honor, calling her the Great Saint. Pope Gregory XVI called Saint Philomena the Thaumaturga, the Wonder Worker of the 19th century, and as already mentioned, in 1837 he raised her to the altar of the church with public devotion. He granted her a special feast August 11th and also approved a mass in her honor. Blessed Pope Pius IX had an exemplary devotion to St. Philomena. While still a bishop, he went on a pilgrimage several times to her tomb to offer Mass, and as Pope, he declared St. Philomena the patroness of the children of Mary. 
On November 7, 1849, at a critical moment of his pontificate, Pius IX went on pilgrimage to the tomb of St. Philomena to seek her intercession at a time of church crisis. A political revolution had taken place in Rome and with a heavy heart, Pius IX was obliged to leave the city. Joined by many young men of the region, the exiled pontiff walked with olive and palm branches in hand to the tomb of St. Philomena to offer the holy sacrifice of the Mass and employ her intercession for an expedient return to Rome. While at the tomb, the Pope took the reliquary containing the vial of St. Philomena's dried blood, which had been found in her tomb, and traced the sign of the cross on his forehead. He was later to confide that when kneeling in prayer before the bones of St. Philomena, he received an interior certainty that he would soon return to Rome. Within a time much more brief than expected, Pius IX returned to the Vatican, in thanksgiving for this great grace received through St. Philomena, Blessed Pius IX granted upon her feast day a proper office and mass specific to her. Beyond the normal common office for virgins and martyrs, this was an honor never bestowed on any other Roman martyr who lacked an historical record. At the moment of his death, Pius IX, with love and thanksgiving to the great saint, had his pectoral cross sent to rest on the altar holding the image of his special young intercessor. Pope Leo XIII was another pope in the list of pontiffs who had a special love for St. Philomena. He also had a strong devotion to her before becoming Vicar of Christ. It was Leo XIII who commissioned the beginning of the Arch Confraternity of St. Philomena, and it was he who, with an almost unprecedented generosity, approved and granted an indulgence to the wearing of the cord of St. Philomena. This cord, which we will discuss in more detail later, was colored white and red in honor of the virginity and martyrdom of St. Philomena, and was strongly promoted by St. John Vianney, to whom most historians attribute the origins of the cord. Not only did Leo XIII grant a plenary indulgence for those who wore the cord for the first time, but he also granted a plenary indulgence for three liturgical times of the year associated with St. Philomena. Furthermore, a plenary indulgence was granted to those wearing of the cord at the hour of their death. In the 20th century, Pope St. Pius X continued the strong papal tradition of veneration of St. Philomena. In 1905, on the occasion of the centenary of her arrival in Mugnano, he sent his gold ring to adorn the image of St. Philomena located over her tomb. In that same year, he beatified the cure of ours, St. John Vianney, who had such a primordial devotion to St. Philomena. St. Pius X was also a great advocate of wearing the court of St. Philomena and declared, all the decisions and declarations of his predecessors regarding St. Philomena should in no way be altered. With this act, he perpetuated devotion to St. Philomena for all times. Pius X also elevated the Arch Confraternity of St. Philomena to the status of a universal Arch Confraternity. In sum, 19 acts of the Holy See during the pontificates of five popes were issued in positive promotion of popular devotion to St. Philomena. In the forms of public liturgical veneration, arch confraternities, and plenary and partial indulgences. The succession of papal veneration and indulgences is arguably unprecedented in the pontifical granting of devotional privileges for any modern saint. The cure in his dear little saint. We have already mentioned the devotion to St. Philomena of such great souls in the church as Blessed Ana Maria Taigi and Venerable Pauline Jarico yet they are far from being the only saints who loved and honored her. St. Peter Juliane Mard was cured of a serious illness after visiting St. John Vianney and being instructed by him to pray a novena to St. Philomena. St. Peter Chanel, the first saint and martyr of Oceania, preached on St. Philomena and said that it was she, after Our Lady, who was his principal intercessor in his apostolate. He referred to St. Philomena as his auxiliary, Blessed Damien de Wooster of Molokai, the leper priest, dedicated his first parish church and first home to St. Philomena. St. Madeleine Sophie Barat consistently invoked Philomena during difficulties in the establishment of her societies and attributed a miraculous cure of a dying novice to her intercession. Other devotees of St. Philomena from the ranks of the saints and blessed include St. Magdalene of Canosa, Blessed Bartolo Longo, and Blessed Annibale da Messina. St. John Vianney and St. Philomena. 
There is little doubt, however, that the special relationship between St. John Vianney and St. Philomena, his dear little saint, was beyond that of all other saints. From the first time he heard of St. Philomena, this old French priest and the young Roman martyr obtained a union of heart which led to consistent, direct, supernatural fruits and experiences. In fact, the cure of ours habitually attributed all miracles that came through him to the intercession of St. Philomena. In 1837, the cure of ours erected the first chapel in France dedicated to his dear little saint. This phenomenal combination of St. Philomena, miracle worker of the 19th century, and St. John Vianney, reader of souls, and now the universal patron saint of parish priests, produced wonders of grace awesome to behold. Whenever someone would come to the cure for healing or other graces, he would invariably direct them to St. Philomena with sure confidence, usually advising them to make a novena of prayer to her, visit her chapel, and commend their need to her with confidence. To those in need who could not come in person, St. John would send oil from lamps burning at her tomb in Mugnano. As time progressed and cure's fame spread, Thousands and then tens of thousands of pilgrims came to ours each year from all over the world. As many as 14 miracles per week were recorded in the parish chronicles, so many pilgrims came to ours that an overwhelmed John Vianney once remarked in catechism class, couldn't she work miracles somewhere else? On one occasion, a man from another part of France asked the cure what sort of extraordinary things were occurring in the parish. He replied, What do you mean, extraordinary things in my parish? You must not believe everything you hear. The man replied, Well then, Father, when I get back, I will say nothing is happening in your parish. St. John was forced to admit, In that case, you would be lying. You must not do that. Tell them that everything is happening through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin and St. Philomena. The deaf, the dumb, the blind, the paralyzed, and the possessed are healed but it is only through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin and St. Philomena. St. Philomena appeared to the cure of ours numerous times, including in May 1843. Critically ill with double pneumonia, Father Vianney had been given up for dead. After receiving the last rites, he asked that Mass be offered for St. Philomena on his behalf. Immediately, St. Philomena appeared to the dying priest and healed him, and in the process, revealed personal information to the cure. This illumination led St. John to consult with St. Philomena about important decisions for the rest of his life. On another occasion, Vianney confided to a dear friend his account of an apparition of St. Philomena. I had a hard time discovering the will of God concerning an enterprise that bothered me. I asked to know the will of God. St. Philomena appeared to me. She had come down from heaven and she was beautiful, luminous, surrounded by a white cloud. She told me twice, Your works are more perfect because there is nothing more precious than the salvation of souls. The specific item troubling VNA concerned a new church in ours. The structure needed funding and the assistant pastor wished to take the money designated for the parish mission and use it for the new church. St. John did not feel peaceful about this transference of funds and he therefore consulted St. Philomena. She instructed him to do what he originally planned to do, that is, to use the funds for the parish mission, because this work was more perfect. While we cannot here provide an exhaustive survey of the hundreds of miracles that took place in ours through St. Philomena and St. John Vianney, a few examples can illustrate the abundance of graces poured out through their combined intercession. Francois Ferdinand, a hotel keeper at ours, related this miracle during the canonization process of St. John Vianney. This is what happened to me. I came down with a serious illness which caused terrible swelling to the point that it had reached my chest. I was taken to Villefranche for medical care. The doctors declared that my blood was contaminated and there was no remedy for it. With that, my parents absolutely wanted to take me back home. The cure came to see me. He told me that I had only two days to live, but that if I were willing to have confidence and follow his advice, I would be healed. If you make a novena to St. Philomena with your parents and me, he said, when it is over, you will go to Fourvière in Thanksgiving. This seemed impossible to me, but I followed his advice anyway. On the fourth day, I was able to get up, and on the ninth, I harnessed my horse myself and went to Lyon with my family. 
During the Cure's canonization process, Mrs. Marie Robert of Clermont-Ferrand relates the following incident, which occurred in September 1857. Father Vianney was teaching his 11 o'clock catechism class. I can still see him in his little stall next to the Blessed Virgin's altar. The omnibus arrived. All of a sudden, the church door opened abruptly, causing us to turn our heads to look. Three people were there by the holy water font, a woman and a man holding a child in his arms. Looking at these newcomers, Father Vianney said to them with a sigh, Poor people, you came so far to seek something here that you have at home. Your faith is great. Then he went on with his catechism lesson. At the end, after reciting the Angelus, he spoke again to the father and mother in a loud voice, saying, Take your child to St. Philomena, over there to the left. The unfortunates crossed the church and went to kneel before the statue of St. Philomena. Suddenly, we heard a loud noise of moving chairs. The father had passed out on hearing his son speak for the first time. The six-year-old boy had been paralyzed, deaf, and dumb from birth. Nice, Papa, nice! The child said in his native patois, and he began to walk. The man explained to us, weeping with joy, we came to ours to ask for the healing of our son, who has never talked and never walked. Mrs. Claudine Raymond from chalon sur saone was suffering a great deal from a chronic infection of the larynx and bronchial tubes. She could not speak the slightest word without feeling a pain in her throat, which was described as being burned with a red-hot iron. She communicated with those around her by writing on a slate. Finally, abandoned by the doctors, she had recourse to Father Vianney. The following is the woman's account as testified during the canonization process. I consulted with him on my condition. He said to me, My child, the remedies of earth are useless for you. You have already had too many of them administered to you. But God wants to heal you. Speak to St. Philomena. Place your slate on her altar. Do violence to her. Tell her that if she does not want to give you your voice back, she will give you hers. At once I went and cast myself at the feet of the little saint. I was healed as soon as I had said my prayer. I had not spoken for two years and had been suffering acutely for six. When I returned to Madame Favier's where I was lodging, I read a few pages on confidence in the Blessed Virgin in a loud voice in front of several people. I was truly cured. When I saw Father Vianney again, he said to me, My child, do not forget to make your thanksgiving and make sure you are here for the feast of St. Philomena. I was faithful to his recommendation. During Mass on the following August 11th, I sang a hymn in honor of my dear benefactress in a loud, sustained voice. After the office, Father Vianney congratulated me for having obtained from the St. Philomena the faculty of singing as well as that of speaking. The profound unity of heart which manifested itself in these ecclesiastically documented miracles makes one thing unquestionably clear. St. Philomena is a real person in the communion of saints and an active presence in the church on earth. How could any question remain as to the true historical existence of St. Philomena or concerning her saintly existence in heaven? When another canonized saint of the stature of St. John Vianney has perpetually testified to her reality, a reality guaranteed by intercession, miracles, and even by actual apparitions of the young saint. Either St. John Vianney was a great saint or he was gravely psychologically disturbed. If he was insane, the church would not have canonized him as his mystical and supernatural experiences, especially with St. Philomena, were so much a part of his entire priestly life and spirituality. If he was sane, then we must admit that St. Philomena exists, as the cure assures us she is. Indeed, the cure of ours once declared, I have never asked for anything through the intercession of my little saint without having been answered. This heavenly union of hearts between St. Philomena and St. John Vianney, which led to so many graces being granted the mystical body of Christ, is beautifully conveyed in the words of the late Henry Cardinal Manning of England. Mysterious and wonderful is the sympathy which thrills through the communion of saints, unbroken by distance, undimmed by time, unchilled by death. The youthful saint went forth from her mother's arms to die for Christ. The lictor's axe cropped the budding lily, 
and pious hands gathered it up and laid it in the tomb, and so fifteen centuries went by, and none on earth thought upon the virgin martyr who was following the Lamb whithersoever he went, till the time came when the Lord would have her glory to appear, and then he chose a champion for her in the lonely toil-worn priest to whom he had given a heart as childlike and a love as heroic as her own. He gave her to be the helpmate of his labors and bade her stand by him to shelter his humility behind the brightness of his glory, lest he should be affrighted at the knowledge of his own power with God. For many saints, the veneration of the faithful finds important foundation in the edifying events of their earthly life. For St. Philomena, things were different since there were no records about her short life until her martyrdom in the prime of her life. Therefore, St. Philomena has ascended to the glory of the altars not for what we concretely know about her brief earthly existence, but for the countless graces and miracles that God has lavished through her powerful intercession. Because she lived her life focusing on the love of Christ, she became very dear to God's divine heart. What is missing in the veneration of St. Philomena regarding historic records is abundantly compensated for by the richness and multiplicity of the miracles she performed thanks to her intercession from the day of the translation of her bones from Rome to Mugnano. Rightly, Pope Gregory XVI defined her as the thaumaturge of the 19th century. Everyone who gets close to her with faith is helped in body and soul. For example, the miracles performed by the Saint Denars were so many that the pious parish priest, Jean-Marie Vianney, had to pray that these would diminish in order not to be distracted from the caring of souls. From the many miracles performed, we have chosen just a few of them which we will divide into two groups. In the first, we will place the healings, and although reported by people worthy of trust, these can give rise to some uncertainty for lack of documentation. In the second group, we will place the extraordinary and at the same time widely corroborated by official acts and authoritative recognitions. Miracles certified in published works on the saint's life but of which the direct corroboration is unknown. A. Healing of an ulcer on the hand which turned into cancer of a Neapolitan woman while the body of St. Philomena was in Naples in the house of Antonio Teres. In Naples, a noble woman had been sorely tried by her body. A hand ulcer had turned into cancer. Amputation was urgently required. All preparations had been carried out for the operation. By the evening, the pious woman, recalling that the early Christians would place on the affected part of the body some kind of relic of a martyr to heal it, she applied on her horrible sore a small particle of St. Philomena's relics. The next morning, the surgeon, uncovering with caution the patient's hand, realized with wonder that the ulcer was no longer there. The hand was rosy and healthy like a baby's. A verbal process of this healing was written down by the public notary Antonio Montuori. B. Healing of a crippled boy eight days after the translation of 1805. This is how this miracle is described by Monsignor Gennaro Ippolito, rector of the sanctuary. In the last of the eight days during the celebration of the solemn mass, at the moment the sacred host was raised, suddenly beside the widow Angela Guerriero from the village of Mercogliano and her only son Modestino of about ten years of age crippled in such a way that he could not even stand, stood up. His mother had brought him to the church with the hope of having him healed. The mother, watching him walking quickly to reach the urn, full of joy, began shouting, Miracle! Miracle! All the people who knew the boy and his inability to walk repeated the same words. Then the boy was taken all around the village, walking and acclaiming by himself. A crowd of incredulous people were following him. See, healing of a blind girl. It's once again Hippolito reporting this. In the Vespers of the same day, the eighth day after the translation of 1805, the size of the crowd that attended was incredible. The majority not being able to enter the church was forced to stay outside. During the preaching of Father Antonio Vetrani, missionary of the Congregation of St. Peter and Cesarano in the Mugnano area, 
A woman from Avela was allowed into the church with her little girl of about two years, blind because of smallpox and considered incurable by the main doctors of Naples. As soon as that mother was close to the sacred urn, she applied the oil from the lamp on her girl's eyes who, in that instant, recovered her eyesight. Both mother and daughter started to shout, the daughter with happiness, the mother with faith. Instantly, inside and outside the church, the news of the miracle began to spread, and the crowd were in turmoil with curiosity. There was a man present who had the reputation of a non-believer. Struck by the marvel he had witnessed, he offered spontaneously to help financially with the erection of the chapel that for some time had been planned to be built for the saint's cult. Here, we have two miracles, the opening of the eyes of an innocent girl and the opening of the eyes of the soul in a sinner. D. Healing of the canonical Monsignor Don Joseph Stella, assistant of the Archbishop of Imola, Monsignor Giovanni Maria Mastai Ferretti, later Pius IX. It is once again the rector of the sanctuary, Father Gennaro Ippolito, who describes this. The canonical Monsignor Don Joseph Stella, assistant of the Archbishop of Imola, Monsignor Giovanni Maria Mastai Ferretti, today gloriously reigning highest pontiff Pius IX, great devotee of St. Philomena and propagator of her cult in that city in the year 1834, was ready to close his eyes for the last time and to meet his maker. When looking at a picture of the saint that he had near his bed, he sincerely invoked her. The divine protectress with a particular sign informed him that she was donating him full recovery. Healed, he decided to go in person to the sanctuary in Mugnano to give thanks to the saint and remain for six days to fulfill this duty. His health remained perfect. He provided important services to the reigning highest pontiff Pius IX for over 40 years and in the month of July 1870, occupying the post of wardrobe valet to the Pope at a respected age, he passed on to a better life. E. Resurrection from the death of an eight-year-old boy. It is still a polito that writes Rosa di Lucia, noblewoman of Mugnano, cousin of Father Francesco di, caretaker of the sacred body of St. Philomena, one day while holding one of her sons, only eight years old who had been ill for a long time, saw him passing away in her motherly arms. After having wet the cold corpse with the warmest of tears, and having made sure that there was no trace of life, animated by true faith, she took the dear image of the thaumaturgic saint, and placing it on the small body of her deceased son, with loud screams and uncontrollable crying, she kept begging for the grace of life. And the sun, like someone waking up after a deep lethargic sleep, rose again to new life and gave himself to the love of his mother. F. A fire distinguished due to the presence of a St. Philomena image, which is untouched by the flames. Miracles similar to the one of the house of the St. John Vianney, Couré of Ars, where the fire stopped just in front of the reliquary of the saint. Monsignor Joseph Senya, Bishop of Marzi, wrote this to the rector of the sanctuary of Mugnano. We have had another miracle happening in my area of Poggio Ginolfo, where there has been devotion for St. Philomena and was displayed to the public in May 1834 with the solemnity of an image of the saint. On November 8, the fire broke out in the fireplace of Giuseppe Laurenzi. It was inextinguishable by human hands. It was about midday and threatened the houses nearby, causing screams and cries from the frightened neighbors. The consternation was so great that the church bells were rung to gather the people and protect them from danger. Although water and mud was being used, and it was raining, the ruinous flame became hungrier and more terrible. Then a general cry arose from the crowd with these words, Bring the image of St. Philomena! Immediately, the priest, my nephew, Father Cosma Senya, was called. He quickly took a paper image that he had in his domestic oratory, rushed over with incredible speed, went into the house, passing among the swarming crowd, and said, Here is St. Philomena. And publicly, he threw the image in the burning fireplace, and as if pushed by the wind, she was seen rising high above the flames, inside the chimney and she disappeared from everyone's view. 
After watching this, all the onlookers were anxious and alarmed, and each one of them thought about transporting their belongings out of their homes so that the fire would not destroy and incinerate them because it looked as if it would expand to the whole village. When, against all expectations, after about no more than five or six minutes, suddenly the threatening flame was extinguished and everyone present saw the sacred image of St. Philomena return. It came down the chimney like a dove of peace, fluttered across the room, and settled on the left side of the fireplace, untouched and unaltered by the fire, like a trophy victorious against the voracious flame. The observing crowd exclaimed full of admiration, Oh, great miracle of St. Philomena! And with highest veneration, everybody tried to kiss the prodigious image. The prodigies here described are only a small part of the ones reported in the various works about St. Philomena. Hippolyto's volume alone describes over 100 of them that, in the majority of cases, show true characteristics of miracles. Miracles cooperated by official acts and authoritative recognitions from popes, bishops, and important people. A. Killing of the lawyer Alexander Serio. His gift of the altar and the prodigy of the marble table miraculously repaired. This miracle is also described by Hippolito. Another great devotee of St. Philomena was a certain Neapolitan lawyer, D. Alessandro Serio, who in the year 1814 was in Mugnano with his wife, Lady Giovanna Fusco, for their holidays. He had been suffering for many years from a serious internal illness, and through the intercession of the saint, he was hoping for a full recovery. For this reason, he prayed with fervor at the saint's altar. This continued for eight days when he was suddenly struck by severe abdominal pains, and he was instantly taken home and placed in bed. The illness grew so much worse that in a few hours, he had little time left to live without the possibility of confession. Concerned by so much pain, his spouse took a frame with a picture of the saint and placed it on her husband's body begging for the grace of seeing him pass away at least with the holy sacraments and promising to have an altar in the chapel of St. Philomena made of marble. In that instant, Serio's responsiveness returned and he was completely out of danger. During his sacrament of confession, the deadly pain disappeared completely and with it, the old disease. In the meantime, the work for the marble altar started in favor of the grateful mercy received by the Serio family, and the saint marked this work with particular prodigy. The required materials were obtained, all made of the finest marble and rare stones. The work began and it already reached of the stage of positioning the top, made of one single marble slab, when the marble worker, Di Giovanni Simafonte, grooving for the positioning of the sacred stone, cracked the marble slab in the middle with the first blow of the chisel for three quarters of the slab length. At this unexpected misfortune, the craftsman was worried not much for his reputation but more for his job since he believed that it was impossible to continue the work, expecting with the successive blows that the remaining intact part of the slab would break too. With the use of an iron bar, he even tried to reinforce the side where the crack was, which was wider than a finger, and he tried to tighten it as much as he could. He continued his work with the help of drills, and the sacred stone was slotted in the appropriate groove. It still had the crack more than a finger wide, but then another prodigy. While the hand of the worker filled the crack, the invisible hand of the saint restored the marble, joining both parts and leaving only a very thin line to evidence the miracle, so that it looked like a natural marble vein. This prodigy took place in a public church in front of many citizens. The news traveled throughout the whole village, and one of the witnesses took the slab from the table that was first cracked and then restored, showed it to the crowd, and hitting it with the sledgehammer, let the crowd hear the sound that it was that of a whole marble. In memory of this portentous event, a marble inscription can be read by the visitor who enters that sanctuary. It is situated on the left wall at the entrance. The altar that can be seen in this church in front of St. Philomena's body, Martyr of Christ and Venerable Virgin, during its erection the sacred table was broken by the hand of the artist and by the hand of the Almighty, restored in one piece in front of a crowd of citizens. And the work of God's finger left, as it can be noted, a dark line. 
This happened in the year of the redemption, 1814. B. Miracle of the Sweating of St. Philomena's Statue In 1806, Cardinal Luis Ruffalo Schilla, 1750-1832, Archbishop of Naples, 1802-1832, donated a wooden statue of St. Philomena to the sanctuary containing in its chest cavity a reliquary which enclosed a small bone particle belonging to the martyr, as reported by Hippolito. This statue is brought every year in procession through the streets of Muniano on the second Sunday of August. On August 10, 1823, during the procession, the statue became heavier. The next day, the statue sweated fragrant mana for three consecutive days. Regarding this, there are two public records, one signed by the vicar Foranio and by 17 priests of the clergy of Muniano, the other by the mayor, the chancellor, and from the members of the council. These records were deposited in the Municipal Archive and in Our Lady of Grace Church in Muniano. In memory of this, a marble inscription was placed in the Church of Our Lady of Grace. C. Miracle in the Church of the Cesarea Naples of the Statue of St. Philomena's Facial Transformation in June 1925, the charitable Miss Maria Cementano, accompanied by her friend Maria Compare, went to the studio of the famous artist Luis de Luca, and with sincere and courageous words, she exposed her fervent wish of a statue of St. Philomena for the Church of the Cesaria. It was to be made of paper mache, and the artist had to create only the hands, head, and feet since the young devotee wanted to dress the saint personally with a white dress and a purple cloak. At first, he refused, saying that, as he was a famous artist, he was used to making his artistic shapes in bronze and marble, not paper mache. He wanted to give full expression and life to his figures. He did not just make mutilated heads and stumps of saints. Later on, convinced by the insistence of the young woman, he accepted. He fell in love with his subject. He lived that period of virginity and martyrdom in the intimacy of his heart, and he completed the statue, which was presented on August 13, 1925. Some days later, De Luca was no longer happy with his work. While everybody praised it, he felt the need to correct it. For a full month, he relived his St. Philomena, and only on September 30th was the statue returned to the sanctuary of the Cesarea. The 1st of October was the important vigil. In the morning, there was a very animated discussion between Luis de Luca and Monsignor Fabozzi, superior of the sanctuary. The latter believed that the statue was a masterpiece, perfect features, beautiful expression, but the people would not recognize in the statue their saint because De Luca had decided to represent an agonizing young girl, giving the image a cadaverous look, the eyelids down, the lips a purplish color. This statue represented a dying person, perhaps a heroine, but certainly not a martyr. On that lovely face, there was no rosy glow or trace of mystic passion. The reason for which the statue had no life was simple. The artist did not have spiritual sensibility, Monsignor Fabozzi tried to explain to De Luca that St. Philomena was a martyr and that martyrs, in the supreme moment, they are luminous. They are inflamed with the love of God. They are never as alive as in the instant in which they die. De Luca did not want to listen to any of this. The barrier between them was not about a different concept of art, but a different concept of faith. The work was temporarily placed in the sacristy. During that day, it was seen by many priests, nuns, ladies of charity, and they all shared the same opinion. She was nice, she was beautiful, but she looked like a cadaver. The same young ladies who had ordered the statue were unhappy and tried to persuade the artist to color her up a little. But when they heard that this would have requested more time, they decided to leave it as it was. Disappointed, they asked De Luca to personally place the purple cloak artistically on the statue. The next day was the 2nd of October, Feast of the Angels, and Monsignor Fabozzi was celebrating the Mass in their honor, where there was an altar dedicated to them. When Father De Milo, who was to celebrate the next Mass, arrived, he did not think it was convenient to put his clothes in the sacristy during the celebration of a religious service, and contrary to his usual behavior, went in the last room.